Oh, hello. Uh, I don't normally write out my talks, but I did today for you all. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, my talk is entitled Designing for the Somatic Imagination. Um, <clears throat> what got me interested in LARP is this amazing interplay between physical reality and an imaginary reality, how they overlap and interact with each other. I use my somatic practices in my LARP designs, and in this talk, I want to speak about why the body is so important for the imagination and vice versa, and how I use somatic practices to enhance the somatic imaginary experience for the participants in my LARP or LARP-like experiences. Um, so what is imagination? From Wikipedia, it says, imagination is the ability to produce images, ideas, and sensations in the mind without any immediate input from the senses. Um, it is also described as forming the forming of experiences internally in the mind, which can be recre recreations of past experiences or slightly modified, or the creation of new experiences or images or sensory information. Imagination is considered to be a cognitive process used in mental functioning. However, it's not considered to be exclusively a cognitive activity, and so this is, gets a little murky for me personally, but I'll, talk, I'll address it later, because it is also linked to the body and to place, particularly that it also involves setting up relationships with materials and people. Um, so this precludes the sense that the imagination is locked away in the head. Um, so if imagination is a cognitive function, then what is cognition? Um, <laughs> oh, oh, this, by the way, is um, the imagination in the brain. So there's a theory, there's not a lot of scientific uh, research about the imagination, there's more and more, but this is, um, the map of uh, mentally manipulating an object or an image in the mind. So it happens across all of the mind in different areas that handle different sensory inputs or information. So what is cognition then? So cognition is the mental action or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought, experience, and the senses, which I will emphasize in my talk, it encompasses, encompasses many aspects of intellectual function, such as attention, uh, memory, problem solving, the production of language, and imagination. Cognitive processes are, uh, use existing knowledge, but they also generate new knowledge. Um, so, I want to talk about the embodied nature of cognition, and I'm going to go out on a limb and use this uh, work of a philosopher, Peter Carruthers, and um, he basically says that all conscious thought, uh, which is a cognitive process, has a sensory basis. So we have to either say it to ourselves internally or or maybe make an image for something in order to be conscious of our cognitive processes. And whatever the source of those internal senses are is another topic for another talk. Um, but one clue might be that the mind doesn't actually store images um, or other kind of information in whole chunks that are, are stable, but they're constantly uh, reforming them. Uh, so, it doesn't mean that all cognition has a sensory element, but in order to make use of it, we need it to be sensory in some way. So, yeah, the senses. <laughs> um, yeah, so when you consider what the brain is, which is often where cognition is uh, located in our current Western sense of cognition and mind and such. Um, even the brain itself is more distributed in the body than we are conventionally taught about or that we often uh, think about. And I don't know if 
have any of you seen that brain meme on the internet, the flying spaghetti monster <laughs> meme? <laughs> so basically, the brain itself would be nothing without the nervous system, which is distributed in the whole body, um, and the senses, so that slide again, um, are also highly connected to our bodily experience of the world. And even our concept of what the senses are is expanding. So there's sight, hearing, taste, smell, touch. But even those traditional senses are not as simple as, once, as we once thought. Um, there's also, it's sometimes considered its own sense, proprioception, which is um, information from uh, stretch receptors in the skin, muscles, and joints that combine with visual information and uh, the vestibular system, which is the, the ears and the, also the eyes working together, and that ha creates our sense of balance. Um, let's see. There are also olfactory senses, sensors located all over our body, and they help the body have an internal sense of itself. It helps cells sense each other and themselves. Um, but some of this also goes directly into the nervous system. And um, there's also, they've discovered um, maybe there's a magnetic, a sense of mag magnetism because there's a magnetite in the brain. Some of it natural and some of it from air pollution. <laughs> um, yeah, and then there's even this sense of the second brain, the, the gut brain of the intestines. The intestines has uh, 500 million uh, neurons, and it creates 90% of the serotonin in our body. So all of this potentially, or I hope, could make a human question about the location of cognition then, and then by extension, imagination. And perhaps it's not so centralized as we're led to believe. Um, and it's not as simple as the brain thinking up stuff to do and then delivering orders down to this sort of dumb body. Um, so I'm a somatics practitioner, and what does that mean? Um, somatics is a field within bodywork and movement studies which emphasizes internal physical perception and experience. Um, I would then say it is an emphasis on the internal sensorial perception or experience of the body. Um, it has links to other practices, dance especially. It's influenced by Eastern mindfulness practices such as yoga, tai chi, and aikido. Um, somatics is often based in movement, although there's a bodywork element to most practices. And they're not just awareness trainings, but they're also therapeutic practices, and they're also very creative often with an emphasis on improvisational movement and interaction. Uh, oops. And here's a kind of lineage, I, I guess you can't read it, but um, of different somatic practice, uh, practices. So you might be familiar with Feldenkrais or Alexander Technique. Um, and then I've studied something that comes out of body-mind centering. Um, there is a somatic practice called idiokinesis, and this is basically how the images we have of our body affect how we use our body and vice versa, how we've been used or how we m use our bodies affect the way we conceive of our bodies. Um, and then I think that this basic concept is then alive in most somatic practi practices. So um, somatics then, and well, idiokinesis and most somatic practices then intervene on this process to invite new senses of body being into awareness and then into actuality. And um, body mind uh, centering works a lot with developmental movements so that the way that human babies develop and it links it often to the way ant the ways animals move. And so it invites this uh, imaginary 
a sensorial experience of a, a, a different species, a way of being as a way to tap into either what your body already is like or maybe invite a new sensation of your body. And then, so somatic design in LARP, it's obviously already happening. Um, <laughs> we already had some really great examples, I think, tonight with using uh, movement, music, uh, music dance, um, obviously scenography, costuming, sound, food, smell. So LARP designers are very aware of how these external elements feed the senses and how their effective power on emotions and behaviors. And there's already a lot of utilization of embodiment practices in a lot of LARPing, right? So guided visualizations, embodied or movement-based exploration of character, et cetera, et cetera. I think we all know a lot of these. <laughs> and the wonderful Ars Armandi, of course, is an example of a very sophisticated, I think, somatic mechanism and is actually what attracted me to Nordic LARP in the first place. I was so blown away by a whole community of people that I didn't have any awareness about before, using an exercise that would be very similar to what you might do in a somatics class. Oops, for example, oops, oh no. <laughs> dyslexia, okay, um, somatic dyslexia. Uh, I would like to offer then um, how I um, use somatic practices to kind of go further into this somatic design for LARP. Um, I have this LARP called Xenosomatics, or sometimes I call it the Guild. And um, it's definitely me experimenting with uh, using somatic practices. Uh, I took from the Xenogenesis series by Octavia Butler. Hopefully some of you have read that at least. And um, these books are a complex exploration of racism, Western culture, um, reproductive politics, an existential pondering on power, autonomy, and what it means to be human. And uh, for those of you that haven't read it, the basic synopsis is there's this alien race of intergalactic genetic traitors that have saved what's left of humanity from their own self-destruction by nuclear war. But the catch is that they want to mate with humans because that's how they keep themselves going. So humans are faced with extinction, extinction in one way or another. And I was really intrigued by how the aliens in the book heal, how they observe their heightened sensory capabilities and what seems quite familiar to me as a somatic practitioner. And I was wondering if I could take somatic practices and then simulate the alien species or culture from this. Um, <clears throat> so I did a series of somatic workshops leading up to the LARP and that built up my alien culture with different participants, and <clears throat> then I have a very specific mechanism for the mating technique, uh, or the mating ritual of the aliens. So they have three genders, um, and that's what you can see. So actually, it's, it'll come later, but um, the aliens have three genders, and um, male, female, and then a third gender. And they mate in threes then, so usually male, female, and then the uh, third gender uh, participant of the mating ritual. And um, in the book, the, the Uloi, the third gender alien, not only uh, distributes genetic information, but it also taps into the nervous system of the other two participants of the mating ritual. Um, so I took the work that we do with the nervous system in, this, in somatics um, into my mechanism, and I gave participants these maps of the dermatomes, so that's where uh, spinal nerves uh, get innervate the skin in different regions on the body, and I had them map out what they liked and what they didn't like, basically, of the alien cultures and the human cultures. And then, um, then the uloi 
could use that, and you can see that a bit, although it's a bit dark here. Um, there's an ULAI on the, on the left exchanging that information. So this guide was helpful for the, the aliens being mated with to uh, synthesize this and, and simulate this mating ritual. So um, I think that this kind of mechanism requires <laughs> um, experience in sensing into a like, somatic sense of the body, but it's a cumulative process. And I think that LARPing is as well. And um, I think that looking into somatics practices such as this can keep adding layers to the depth of which one can design LARPs and the sophisticated ways LARPs are already designed to hack the interconnected nature of body, mind, and imagination and beingness itself. Thank you. <laughs>